Barbara Bonney. I am serving as your worship leader today. I am grateful to share this service with you this morning, both in person and online. We are a community committed to social justice and to supporting the various spiritual and ethical paths of our members and friends. We also acknowledge that we occupy land that is the ancestral home of the Adena and Hopewell cultures and the Miami and Shawnee peoples. Our congregation strives to be welcoming to all. So you will see signs for various accommodations, such as gender neutral restrooms and hearing assistance devices. These are also listed on the back of the order of service. Please ask our ushers if you have any questions. If you would like to know more about our church or about the Unitarian Universalist faith, please contact us by emailing member-care at firstuu.com. The flowers today are from Jan Smith and Carol Wolf in honor of their granddaughter, Rachel Claire Henry's graduation from high school and acceptance to Wellesley College this fall. <laughs> As we light our chalice today, the chosen symbol of our faith, we humbly recognize that our human lives are never simple. They are complex, confounding, beautiful, and ever-changing. May the light of truth 
constantly shine in our lives so that it might become easier for us to navigate the uncertainty, the wonder, and the mystery of what it means to be fully human. Now, as you are willing and able, rise to uh, sing opening hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. time for all ages for all ages uh, and I was gonna tell the kids about old silent epic movies and what I was going to say is of course I was gonna ask them if they knew what epic means and uh, you know it's just a big movie everything's big the sets are big the stories are big the noise is big uh, what it would be uh, uh, Indiana Jones epic movie Gone with the Wind, epic movie. Ten Commandments, epic movie. Uh, D.W. Griffith, I'm gonna talk about uh, a couple of epic silent movies. Uh, and uh, we'll start, actually we're not gonna talk about The Birth of a Nation first, uh, which is the epic movie. We're gonna talk about an even more epic movie, 1916, D.W. Griffith made Intolerance. And if you can bring up the the first slide, or the, uh, the beginning of the video. Uh, of course, the, the, 
main feature of silent movies is that they were silent, and uh, so they didn't have uh, dialogue. They had uh, what they called titles, which had the dialogue, and they'd show them every once in a while while the movie was showing. And we still have titles, except now they're just the names of the actors and stuff at the beginning and the end. So in, 16, in 1916, they made a movie called Intolerance, and one of the most famous scenes is a big celebration in the city of Babylon. And if we can go forward for a little bit, there we are, there's Babylon. And if we can stop it for just a second, there are over a thousand people in that set. It's a half a mile long. It's more than 10 stories in height. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> this happened when we were practicing too. That's okay, we'll catch up. It's more than uh, a, a half a mile long, 10 stories in height. Each one of those people, when we get back to it, each one of those people is individually choreographed. They've been instructed exactly what they're supposed to be doing, all thousand of them. It was enormously expensive to make these things. And uh, so you can see they're kind of dancing their way down the steps at the beginning there. And uh, we, can, we can go ahead and go forward here because I want you to see something. They did not have telephoto or zoom lenses in those days. They did not have camera cranes. And yet Griffith was able to get the same effect uh, what he did, of course, they had silent crank cameras. You had to turn the crank by hand. And uh, he got the same effect uh, without knowing that was where he was headed by building an elevator. He built an elevator and he mounted, and if you can stop it right there, and he mounted the elevator on a railroad truck on tracks so that they could go up and down and they could go back and forth. And if you look carefully toward the bottom middle of the screen there, you can see the tracks. He's got carpet laid across him in a couple places to kind of break up the shape. And, uh, uh, but he could create the effect of zooming in on the celebration by dropping, lowering the elevator and pushing it forward. And uh, we'll go forward here. Uh, this is an amazing scene. Uh, the birth of a nation, which we're gonna talk about, was the most popular movie ever made. Okay, yeah, this is a close-up, of course, of the king and queen, Belshazzar and his, and his queen. Now, the way they cut movies together, this looks like it's taking place at the same time. It's just a close-up, right, during the celebration. Well, this part was shot in a different place. It may have been weeks before or weeks after, but through the magic of cutting, splicing motion uh, picture film together, it makes it look like it took place at the same time. You can create all sorts of effects that way, just, just by splicing film together. And of course you see that, that wonderful 1916 style makeup. Uh, and uh, uh, the birth of the, the nation was enormously popular, made a lot of money. Actually, intolerance was very popular. People flocked to see it as well, but it lost money because he spent so much money making it. You know, it took months to build the sets. The, the, you, had to, you had to pay extras. You didn't pay them much, but you had to pay them. And Griffith had kind of an interesting career for, he gave us basically what we call the visual vocabulary that we still use watching movies. He showed us what a movie could look like. Uh, but he did not evolve with the times. So he kept making basically the same movie over and over in different settings with very bad people doing horrible stuff to good people, and then right at the end, the good people would get be rescued by the heroes. Uh, that was the plot of Birth of a Nation. That's the key plot of this one. There's actually four parallel storylines, but that's what it comes down to. Uh, so that after about 1920, uh, his movie stopped making money, uh, and he made his last movie in 1932. He did make a couple of sound films. He had not made a profitable picture in years. 
and his last two sound movies, they lost movie, money. The movies he made in the early 1920s lost money, and he retired at the age of not much more than 50 because he was a flop. People didn't go to his movies anymore. He still had plenty of money. He didn't die poor, but he did die alone. And, uh, but his, uh, his problem was that he could not evolve with the times. Uh, uh, that he, he was still living in the epic 1915 style, I mean, we couldn't, could, didn't really adapt to talkies, didn't really adapt, adapt to more mobile uh, and livelier storylines. Uh, but if you want to visit his grave, you can do that pretty easily. He's buried uh, just on the south side of the Ohio River between Cincinnati and Kentucky and, and Louisville in a little town called Centerville, Kentucky. And you go to this little Methodist church in Centerville, Kentucky, and behind the church, I've been there, it's this great big huge tomb that's like half the size of this room with D.W. Griffith in it. So, uh, so he, he died very well, uh, but he had to retire early because he couldn't evolve with the times, and that's, uh, that's the message I wanted to leave the kids with. Part of being a beloved community is sharing joys and concerns with each, with each other. If you would like to share something with the congregation through our Circle of Friends email or in the newsletter, or if you'd like to talk with our resident chaplain, Mary Tarbell Green, please fill out the form on the back of your order of service and place it in the offering basket, either when it is passed or on the desk at the back of the sanctuary as you leave the service. And now we will take time to honor the joys and sorrows that are in our hearts. This water before me represents the love of our community. We drop a stone in the water to seek the softening of our sorrows or the amplification of our joys. All the individual joys and sorrows come together in one bowl so that they can be symbolically shared and borne by our community. We invite you now to come forward if you wish, up the side aisles and back down the middle to amplify your joy or soften your sorrow. Outside these walls that go unmentioned. A second stone for those joys and sorrows that go unspoken, but that we have closely guarded in our hearts. And lastly, a stone for the brokenness in our world as we search for ways to be agents of wholeness by placing ourselves in that breach.
Each month, we designate one of our Sunday plate collections to benefit a special cause or local social service organization. Our July Share the Plate recipient is Sweet Cheeks Diaper Bank of Cincinnati. Every day, one in three families in America struggle to afford diapers for their children. Sweet Cheeks Diaper Bank partners with local social service agencies to provide free diapers to low-income families while raising awareness of the basic health needs for diapers. Their vision is to eliminate the existence of diaper need in our community so that all babies have a chance to be healthy, happy, and safe. Giving to First Church is easy. You can text the word GIVE to 513-717-7373. If you have access to our Breeze member system, you may click GIVE now. Fill in the amount and choose among the options. Choose Give This One Time for our Share the Plate option. Or you can give online at firstuu.com and then clicking the Give Now button on our homepage. You can also write a check to First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati and mail it to 536 Linton Street, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45219. If you want to give to Sweet Cheeks, write Sweet Cheeks in the memo line of your check. If this is your first time with us, please let the virtual plate pass you by. Your presence is gift enough to our church. The late Roger Ebert was arguably America's most beloved film critic. After admitting that he had put off watching The Birth of a Nation for years due to his own reluctance to confront the movie's racism, he described his discomfort with it this way. Griffin demonstrated to every filmmaker and moviegoer who followed him what a movie was and what a movie could be. That, that this achievement was made in a film marred by racism should not be surprising. As a nation once able to reconcile democracy with slavery, America has a stain on its soul. To understand our history, we must begin with the contradiction that the Founding Fathers believed all men, except black men, were created equal. Griffith will probably never lose his place in the pantheon of great filmmakers, but there will always be the blot of the later scenes of Birth of a Nation. It is a stark history lesson to realize that this film, for many years the most popular ever made, expressed widely held and generally acceptable white views. Actress Lillian Gish reveals more than she realizes when she quotes Griffith's paternalistic reply to accusations that he was anti-Negro. To say that that is like saying I am against children, as they were our children, who we loved and cared for all of our lives, close quote. We need to watch very old movies because they teach us where we came from. 
A Facebook meme that is popular these days expresses the feelings they should give us. If reading history always makes you feel good, you're not really reading history. going to share some homework uh, from a book I've been working on for more than a year and hopefully we'll have it out before the end of next year. Uh, the Celluloid Periscope, Movies as Windows into America's Soul. So this is the first of a pair of sermons uh, which use old silent movies as a lens into our cultural history. If critical race theory is analysis of how racism is embedded in our nation's legal structure, I use film to explore cultural attitudes that are embedded in the history of movies. Racism is not, of course, the only cultural attitude we can analyze by looking at old films, but it's sure one of them, and that's what we're looking at today. We can learn a lot about what makes any society tick by watching its old movies. One fascinating aspect is that old movies show us attitudes that the director and crew may not have even known they had, but which stick out like sore thumbs when you look back at them 50 or 100 years later. And that includes our deep cultural roots in racism and patriarchalism. The older the movie, the more likely we are to see truly cringe-inducing attitudes. One scholarly theory about film does need to be mentioned, though, what's called auteur theory. Auteur theory holds that major directors, the Steven Spielbergs, the Stanley Kubricks, the Francis Ford Coppolas, and so on, each tend to have a distinctive style so that you can analyze each director's work for common themes. And this certainly applies to America's first truly great film director, D.W. Griffith. He began directing movies in 1908. He was one of the founders of the Hollywood filmmaking industry, and he did more than anyone else to set the standard for the Hollywood blockbuster epic movie. Before Griffith, the earliest movies looked like theater plays, except with the camera taking place, taking the place of the audience. Griffith began to move the camera, tracking individual characters' actions, silent film innovations such as camera cranes, we saw the first one in Intolerance, tracking shots, following the action along, the dolly, forward and back, the pan, right and left, intercut chase scenes, camera angles, rescue scenes, a great many tropes that we now take for, for granted, all evolved by way of D.W. Griffith. He also developed film editing. Depending on how you splice different, different shots together, the same basic collection of film or video can tell radically different stories to radically different effect. When someone talks about the director's cut of a movie, that's what they're talking about. And we take all of that for granted now, but such concepts were revolutionary in the early 1900s. And yet, as film critic Roger Ebert noted, Griffith used his genius to push the worst kind of violent racial bigotry without ever realizing how bigoted he actually was. Southern born, he never questioned his racial assumptions, nor did most other white people. The whole country was just about as prejudiced as he was. And I don't believe Griffith himself ever fully understood the danger of the social and emotional powers 
with which he was so adroitly and yet heedlessly playing. Flawed though our own times are, it's easy to forget how all-encompassing patriarchalism and racial prejudice were a hundred years ago. Griffith and most of his audiences saw non-Europeans or even Eastern or Southern European races as inferior. Men were strong and women were dependent, silly, sometimes downright dangerous. People with disabilities were invariably objects of pity or ridicule, as was anyone who didn't fit into a standard heteronormative gender mode. Griffith's 1915 Civil War epic, The Birth of a Nation, is a study in the power of film. As entertainment, it was decades ahead of its time. Studios in 1915 were nervous whether an audience would even watch a film for more than a half hour. The Birth of a Nation and Griffith's follow-up epic, Intolerance, we saw a clip of that, ran more than three hours each and audiences flocked to see both of them. To the modern viewer, though, the most striking feature of Birth of a Nation, beyond epic Civil War battle scenes, which really are epic, and dated silent film techniques is its mind-boggling racism. All black speaking roles were played by white actors in ludicrous blackface makeup. Time and again, Griffith portrayed black men lusting after white women, but society's paranoia about black sexuality was so great those scenes could only have been filmed with unmistakably white men in blackface makeup. There would have been a riot on the set otherwise. The movie, even at that, the movie so angered white audiences that they often went on to attack black citizens and destroy black owned property. Harvard economics professor Desmond Ang surveyed old newspapers and found a five-fold increase in lynchings right after the birth of a nation would show in a town, particularly in small towns. In Griffith's version of Reconstruction, black Union soldiers occupy the defeated South, freed blacks take over the state legislatures and enact laws to oppress white citizens, the depictions of black lawmakers are just grotesque. They're awful. Meanwhile, the defeated Southern menfolk are reduced to passivity until, as Griffith tells us in a title, quote, the Ku Klux Klan became the organization that saved the South from the anarchy of black rule, close quote. And if you think we've done away with that line of racist thinking, just listen to a white supremacist talk about what they now call replacement theory, or watch Jason Aldean's country music video, try that in a small town. It is still about doing away with black chaos. The post-Civil War Ku Klux Klan had faded away after about 1880, and it was almost non-existent when The Birth of a Nation came out. But with Griffith's box office hit as a recruiting tool, Klan membership skyrocketed. In just 10 years, more than five million men joined the Klan, along with a women's auxiliary of nearly 100,000. Ironically, the bigotry across American society was so huge as to render it invisible. The Birth of a Nation broke all box office records, and it was the first movie specially shown at the White House. And it should not be surprising that it won raves from White House staff, including Virginia-born President Woodrow Wilson. The movie's racism may seem disgusting now, but it bothered relatively few white people at the time. There were some complaints, but not, certainly not in the majority. 
Now in our day, discrimination takes somewhat more subtle forms, and yet today, as in Griffith's day, most people, including many a professed liberal, when confronted about prejudice or insensitivity, still express the same bewilderment and resentment that Griffith did. Racism has changed, at least on the surface, but white fragility has not changed. We've just discovered a new term for it. And here's an example of white fragility. Some people did harshly criticize the birth of a nation's racism. In response, Griffith self-published an angry 45-page pamphlet titled The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America. Now, where have we heard that argument? <laughs> he complained that his freedom of artistic expression was being censored. Mind you, The Birth of a Nation was the most profitable film ever made. It remained the top grossing film in history until long after Griffith died. It was a time when lynchings were common, when black people were not even allowed to sit in white movie theaters, Black youths could and did suffer severe beatings just for setting foot on a white beach or drinking from a white drinking fountain. And yet, D.W. Griffith felt persecuted and censored, those were his words, because a few people, mostly blacks, didn't <clears throat> like his movie. That is how white fragility works. His pamphlet starts out, all in capital letters. Why censor the motion picture, The Laboring Man's University? And he then adds, quote, The motion picture can carry the truths of history to the entire world without cost, while at the same time bringing diversion to the masses, as the cheerless existence of millions would be brightened by this new art, two of the chief causes of war would be removed. The motion picture is war's greatest antidote." Close quote. Now in addition to those accusations of censorship, he then concludes, and I'm I'm quoting again, if I approach success in what I am trying to do with my coming motion picture intolerance, I expect a persecution even greater than that which meant meant the birth of a nation. Now this is Pat Baloney. Let us ponder for a moment just how much self-pity and ego it takes for a successful white businessman to respond to criticism by so believing that he is the one being persecuted and censored. Over the last hundred years, since the birth of a nation came out, the degree of racism, excuse me, the degree of racism in America has certainly changed. Racism looks different in our day, although it is still with us. But white responses, when privilege gets challenged, have really changed very little. The level of defensiveness, silly though it may be when it's viewed from a distance, is still with us. White fragility is nothing new, only the technology and terminology are new. And some film critics and historians, Roger Ebert included, have suggested that Griffith made his next epic intolerance as a kind of apology for Birth of a Nation. And if Griffith's pamphlet isn't enough to prove otherwise, the opening scenes of intolerance do, because that wasn't the opening scene. Griffith's message, right from the beginning, is that society's problems do not come from, say, racial intolerance or Jim Crow or even slavery. The real troublemakers were the uplifters, as he called them, self-satisfied, power-hungry do-gooders who trigger injustice, death, and destruction in a but-for-them happy world. Griffith's use of such language is deeply problematic 
and it's racist on its face. Black intellectuals from George Washington Carver, Carver to W.E.B. Du Bois advocated what they often termed racial uplift, that blacks who gained some position in society should use their relative advantage to uplift their struggling siblings of color. They had different opinions how black people might gain more equality. Carver and Du Bois and those black intellectuals who ranged between them disagreed on many points. But that the word uplift had deep meaning to both makes it a doubly important term. And it is therefore highly unlikely that Griffith could have been unaware of that term in racial discussions of his day, he either didn't know and didn't care, which condemns him as willfully ignorant, or he did know and chose to condemn the very idea, which marks him as willfully racist. Either way, he had no regard for black hopes or aspirations. A few years later, for perspective, a few years later, President Wilson commissioned Griffith to make a propaganda film supporting the United States entry into the First World War. Griffith traveled to Europe and he basically reshot The Birth of a Nation, set this time on the Belgian-French frontier. Germans became the bloody villains instead of black Yankee soldiers. And the French were the heroes. And in the end, instead of the Ku Klux Klan riding to the rescue, it was French cavalry. All movies were, this is the fun part, all movies were by this time subject to cuts by wartime censors. Griffith did not complain about that. He did, however, get his film registered, not in his own name or that of his production company, but as a product of the War Office, the Defense Department of his day. As such, any criticism of his movie could be prosecuted under federal anti-sedition statutes. So much for Griffith's championship of free speech. I include these details, partly because at our own time, some people, including some white Unitarian Universalists, criticized for insensitivity toward marginalized identities, you might say they go full Griffith, accusing their detractors of political correctness run amok, safetyism, cancel culture, censorship, and persecution. The birth of a nation and arguably hearts of the world, Griffith's propaganda movie about the First World War, inspired real hatred and sometimes real violence toward real people. It's also worth noting that only a year or so after proclaiming films as war's greatest antidote, Griffith had turned around and was making a movie that forcefully promoted war. Situational ethics, gang. To Griffith's chagrin, however, President Wilson rejected Hearts of the World because it portrayed Germans as such monsters it was bad for the peaceful and just settlement Wilson sought in post-war negotiations. Portraying American blacks as oversexed animals was one thing. Doing the same to white Germans while the president was trying to lead international diplomacy was quite another. And yet, white actors and set crews who worked with Griffith insist he was not unkind or intentionally racist. He was, they said, sympathetic to good blacks, failing to understand that to him, black goodness could only come through black servility. The profound evil of Griffith's bigotry and that of his society lay not then in his intent but in its effect on those harmed. Good intentions did not reduce the death toll, as Professor Ang's work shows. Marginalization still plays out in real world violence and economic disadvantage in our own day. 
The evil, therefore, lies not in the intent, but in the effect on those who are belittled and degraded, however innocently. And this calls us to confront what we haven't learned since Griffith's day and the necessary discomfort when someone challenges our own acceptance or clueless participation in today's injustices. It's always more comfortable to look away, which might explain why film historians still so often detail the birth of a nation's innovations while glossing over its jaw-dropping racism, even to this day. If we summon the courage to face the multi-layered ugliness of homophobia, transphobia, patriarchalism, and white supremacy culture, and how we ourselves participate in them, if I face my own discomfort and you face yours, I truly believe that we do begin to remake that discomfort into something sacred. We do not make the world a better place or become better people ourselves by staying in our comfort zones. A hundred years after the birth of a nation was setting box office records, we can look back and see its evil in full view. It's worth bearing in mind that a hundred years from now, people will be looking back at us and it's up to us what they will see. Blessed be. Now, uh, as you are able, rise and sing uh, closing hymn number 121, Come Build a Dream.
We have a legacy in our faith and in our nation that is hard to face. We have fallen short of our dreams and our ideals. But it is not too late to turn that legacy into a lesson learned about how to truly build the beloved community that leaves no one behind. Please join me in repeating the words printed on your screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.